Hello everyone, it's Matt and Murray here with the Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium. Thank you for joining us today as we continue our theme for May's at home mission, all about birds. Along with the live stream we do each week, we also offer a really cool virtual scavenger hunt app you can play right at home and a new activity guide each month. To download the app and to explore all of this, go to www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. That address takes you to our mission conservation webpage. On this website, I will bring your attention to the box that says, get the app. Once you click download, that will take you to download the Agents of Discovery app, which you will need to play any mission conservation mission. Once you have the app downloaded, create a user account and log in. Hit the search bar and type in mission conservation. This is where all of our missions, our at-home missions will pop up for you to play. The last place that I'm gonna bring your attention to on this website is schedule of missions and activities. This tab will show you all of the missions we have live, including our current mission, All About Birds. Under this tab, you will also find our activity guide that we all have, we have made for you at home. There will be an awesome craft, an awesome outdoor activity, and something you can do to learn about birds at home. So I'm currently standing here in front of our owl barn within the aquarium. On display in this exhibit, we have some really cool raptors, such as a barred owl, a barn owl, and even our bald eagle, Riser. Speaking of raptors, we have with us today, Hannah Blanke, who is an avian keeper with the Alaska Raptor Center. It's good to meet you, Hannah. How are you doing today? Hi, we're doing good over here. Uh, so I work for the Alaska Raptor Center and we are located in Sitka, Alaska, which is a nice little town that is on an island. So we're not connected to any other cities or towns by roads. We have to take a plane or a boat to get anywhere. Uh, but we do still treat birds from all over Alaska. And the first thing we've got to figure out when we get an animal into our clinic is, do we have a bird or not? So when we're trying to figure out if we have a bird, a lot of things what people might suggest is, does the animal have a beak? Because uh, of course, birds are, uh, birds are well known for the variety of beaks that they have. Depending on the size or shape, it is going to let you know what kind of food that bird is going to be hunting for. For example, ooh, little bird. Oops, sorry, little bird here. Oh, little bird. There we go. For example, this beak here is belongs to a great blue heron, and you can see the long tender slender tip to it uh, acts a lot like a uh, spear would in fishing and the way this bird is going to use that beak is just like spear fishing it's going to stab after its food however there are other animals that also have beaks such as turtles or even uh, squid and octopus Next one, please. so those animals also are going to have beaks so we can't go off of a beak alone next some people might suggest wings Oh, sorry, also duck-billed platypuses uh, known for their beaks. In fact, they get their name from their beaks. So next up, some people might go off of wings, but of course there's plenty of other animals that also have wings. Uh, we've got a variety of insects as well as some of our mammal friends uh, like bats that are going to have wings for flying. So guessing wings is close, but it is not quite there. What we're looking at is what's on the wings. And what's on the wings are feathers. So if you want to know if you've got a bird, number one, you need to look for feathers. All known bird species are going to have feathers. Uh, from this tiny bee hummingbird, even its little tiny eyelashes are going to be feathers. All the way up to the impressive plumage of this peacock here. So they'll use their feathers for a variety of reasons. Uh, for a mating display, for staying warm, sorry, go back. Uh, for staying waterproof, a whole bunch of different choices. As you could probably guess from the name of our organization, the Alaska Raptor Center, we deal a lot with raptors. Uh, we will treat any bird at our hospital, but we do mostly get in birds that are called raptors. 
So if you know you've got a bird because it has feathers, the next step might be, how do you find out if it's a raptor? And one of the first things you're gonna look for are looking at its feet. As you can see, raptors have very strong feet with very sharp talons. And these feet are what they're going to use to hunt their prey. Even smaller raptors are still going to have those feet, those strong, long feet with the big, sharp talons. And you can compare it to a foot like this. This is not a foot for grabbing animals. This is a foot for swimming through the water, as you might have guessed. Uh, this actually belongs to a trumpeter swan. So definitely not a raptor. The next thing you want to look for after the feet is you want to look at the beak. And the beak should have a hook curved edge to it. This beak is what the bird is going to use to tear apart its food. So they don't really use their beaks to fight. Um, if you get bitten by a raptor, it's typically because they don't have any other option. They can't use their feet. Instead, um, they, they have only their beak left to use. But this beak is what they're going to use to tear up their food into bite-sized portions. Uh, if there are feathers, if there are scales, if there are bones, the birds don't worry about it at all they're just gonna swallow all of that right down. And that is true even on small little bird beaks, which we can see in the camera here. Go back, please. So even the small little bird beaks are still gonna have that lovely little hooked edge to it. So you can see in this Merlin beak. Now here in Alaska, we have a couple of different types of raptors. Um, so I'm gonna go through a kind of quick and easy ID for how to figure out what raptor you're looking at. You know it's a bird because it has feathers. You know it's a raptor because it has big, strong feet, sharp talons, and that curved hooked beak. But what kind of raptor might it be? Well, here in Alaska, we've got a couple of different options. First off, the raptor that you're looking at might be an eagle. And a good way to go off of whether or not it's an eagle is really just the size, because eagles are going to be gigantic compared to other birds. Uh, you can see in this photo here, this is a bald eagle, and you can see that fish that it's got, which gives you a pretty good comparison of its size. Um, another type of raptor that you can find here in Alaska are falcons. And falcons are really distinctive when they're flying because their wings make that sort of crescent shape. You also can look at their face. Uh, all falcons are going to have these dark marks under their eyes. And if you think that looks familiar, uh, if maybe you've seen it on people, we actually do the same thing. We'll put dark marks under our eyes when we're playing sports like soccer or football. And for us, that dark marking helps keep the sun out of our eyes. And it's the same thing for falcons. Uh, when they're up, high in the sky soaring. They can't really keep the sun out of their eyes with their wings, they can't do this. So instead those dark marks are going to absorb the sun and make sure it doesn't just get right in their eyes and blind them. Uh, we, next up, we also have hawks flying around Alaska. Um, I think one of, they, they do come in a variety of colors and sizes and habitats. So I think one of the best ways to figure out if you've got a hawk is to look at its face and see if it looks really angry at you. As you can see in this picture, that hawk looks fairly upset. Uh, it's not, it's not upset about anything that is literally just its face. As you can see on this skull here, hawks have these bony ridges over the top of their eyes. You can see there and there. And these bony ridges, are gonna serve the same purpose as a baseball cap. So much like with the falcon, it's gonna help keep the sun out of their eyes. Our last little group of raptors that are found here in Alaska 
are one of my favorites. They are owls. Uh, owls are really distinctive because they tend to have big flat faces. And that big flat face is going to work pretty similarly to the way our outer ear works. So if you've ever had trouble hearing someone and you cup your hand behind your ear, what you're doing is you're making your ear bigger to catch more sound. Instead of having ears like us, owls are going to use their whole face as a big ear. And they can even move their, face, their facial feathers a little bit and adjust them to get the sound going right down into their ears. Another good identifier for owls is their feet. Uh, as you can see in that picture and you can see in this little foot, owls are going to have feathers all the way down to their talons. Uh, this helps keep them warm in cold climates and it's also going to help with their camouflage when they are hiding out during the daytime. Okay. Now working at the Raptor Center, uh, being a bird hospital, we do have to make sure that we are working with our patients as quickly as possible. Because when the birds come into us, they don't really understand that we're trying to help them. All they know is that they're sick or that they're injured. And all of a sudden something big and scary has picked them up, taken them from their home, put them in a strange room, maybe, you know, given them injections of things, fed them strange food. Um, and all of that, as you can probably imagine, leads to the birds feeling pretty stressed out. Now, when birds get stressed, it's very similar to when we would get stressed. Um, our immune system will suffer for that. We'll feel sick, we'll feel achy. It's the same for the birds. So we need to work very, very quickly when we have patients in our clinic. However, as you might guess from those pictures of raptor feet, we also need to make sure that we are staying safe. So one of the ways that we stay safe when we are working with raptors is we actually have safety equipment. If we're just working with birds like hawks or owls, we'll probably just use these gloves. These are the same kind of leather gloves that people use in welding. Um, it does a pretty good job of stopping the bird's talons from going through to our skin. They're not 100% effective, but they do, they do a good enough job. It gives an extra layer of security. If we're working with eagles, we will also wear this nice big leather jacket. Um, now this leather jacket isn't really thick enough to stop an eagle talon. They can punch right through this. In fact, eagles can actually puncture through deer hide. Their feet are so strong. But what this jacket does is if I'm wearing it and the eagle grabs my arm, instead of grabbing just my, my arm and giving me a couple new piercings, the eagle's gonna grab and pull at the jacket. And it's just gonna get the jacket in its foot instead of the bits that matter to me, my arm. We also have equipment that keeps the birds calm. So that's the equipment to keep us safe. But if we want to keep our raptors calm, we will use this. It's called a falconer's hood. And the way you use it is you'll take the bird's head. Very carefully. There we go. You put it through the hood so that only its beak is poking out and its eyes are all covered up. Now, if you do this, you are almost guaranteed to have a much calmer and more relaxed bird. And one of the reasons for that is that raptors especially, they have a lot of their brain power devoted towards what they are seeing. So a lot of the time their brain is working, it's working to figure out what their eyes are seeing. If all their eyes are seeing is darkness, their brain doesn't really have work to do. And oftentimes it will kind of settle down, and sort of relax. So this works really great for raptors. Uh, for other birds, we'll just cover their heads. Now we do also still have to be safe around some other birds. If you remember this beak from earlier, this great blue heron, great blue herons are very well suited to stabbing at shiny things. Because in the wild, that's going to be fish, that's going to be frogs, that's going to be their dinner. 
Now, when we're working with great blue herons in our clinic, we need to make sure we don't have anything shiny that they can attack. And unfortunately, we do have something shiny, namely our eyes. So if you ever come to the Raptor Center and you see us working with, uh, with a great blue heron, you might notice that we all have our safety goggles on just to make sure that we're staying safe and the bird is staying safe. Now, this time of year at the Raptor Center is a pretty exciting one because this time of year is what we call baby season. Um, the birds have gone through their mating behaviors, they've laid their eggs, they're starting to raise their babies, and now trouble might be happening. So I, uh, I'm gonna talk you through what to do if you find a young baby bird. First up, we have this little kind of flow chart to give you a very good idea of what you might need to do if you find a baby bird on the ground. Um, it's a little small, but if you go to the website Bird and Moon, she's a wonderful naturalist artist who does lots of great comics. And basically, there's a couple rules of thumb. Number one, does the bird have feathers or not? If the bird doesn't have feathers, you need to find its nest. If you can find its nest and put it back in there, that's going to give the bird the best chance of survival. Whenever we have an injured bird, we always want to find its parents because the parents will do the best job at raising it. Um, this is especially true if there are any dangers to the bird around. So if it's a little naked bird, try and find its nest. If you can't, then you wanna call a licensed wildlife rehabilitator which basically means someone who has the training and the supplies to properly take care of a young bird. Um, I mentioned that their parents are going to be the best caregivers, and that's absolutely true. Next up to that is people who have training, because these little birds, they're going to need specific food, they're going to need um, specific nests even. If they don't have the right shaped nest, it can their legs don't develop right. And they're gonna need to be raised by people who know how to keep those little birds wild. So it's really important to make sure these young birds are going towards the right caretaker. Now there is a myth that I've still heard that talks about if you handle a baby bird, the parents will smell you and then they won't want anything to do with that baby. Uh, happily, that is just a myth, it's not true. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overly touch a baby bird because that might stress it out. Um, but the parents are not going to care what their baby smells like. Now, if you put that baby back in the nest and the parents kick it out, that does sometimes happen, then your step is again to call someone with experience. If you find a baby bird out of the nest and it has feathers on it, that could just be a bird that's starting to explore its world. So young birds will hop out of the nest before they can fully fly to try and get some training in that flight ability. Those birds you can actually just leave out. The only time you want to bother with these little birds is if there are cats or other predators in the area. Um, because these young little birds, they still don't quite have the flight ability. So if there are any outdoor cats, uh, those baby birds are not gonna make it. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, even if the cat is just playing with the bird, uh, if the cat, claws or bites the bird and punctures the skin, then that bird is going to get a really intense infection from all the bacteria in the cat's mouth. So we have to be careful when we get young birds in or old birds that have been attacked by cats, we have to give them antibiotics. Um, but if there are no cats or other predators around, you can actually just leave that bird on the ground and it'll hop around, it'll get back to its parents, it'll probably jump right down again and try and fly. Um, but otherwise, it is good to go. It's just learning its natural wild life. Um, next up is a picture of what a nestling looks like. So you can see the eyes are closed, it's not standing. This is a bird that needs to be in the nest. So you either find the nest or you call someone who knows, uh, someone with training. The next example is a fledgling. Uh, you can tell it almost looks like a proper bird. It just has what we like to call Einstein hair, all those little fluffs coming out of its head. 
Now, this is a bird that is practicing the fly, and so it can't avoid any dangers, but as long as the area is safe, you can let it be. It can just wander around and be happy. Um, one of the other reasons we always stress that you should bring a bird to a, re a, a licensed wildlife rehabilitator is because birds go through something called imprinting. Imprinting is basically when they decide what they are and they're gonna make this decision based off of what is feeding them. So if you've ever seen those pictures of a little baby bird being fed by a puppet, that is because the people are trying to keep that little bird wild, uh, which you can see in this picture right here. So this little bird is being raised by people, but they wanna make sure that the bird knows it's a bird, essentially. Uh, here at the Raptor Center, we will actually use little puppets. So we will house these in with our young raptors, just so that what they're seeing are birds of their own species. Because if we talk too much to the babies or if they know that we are giving them food, they might see us as their parents, which sounds really cute, but what it means is that those birds will never be able to live in the wild. They won't be able to hunt, they won't be able to find a mate, so it's really, really important when we have young babies in that they're being mostly supervised by the species that they are. Now, wildlife rehab uh, of all sorts can be very stressful and very hard. Um, a lot of days you put in all this work and nothing really good comes of it. But there are also plenty of days where you put in tons of work and you get great results. So what I'd like to finish up with is showing you some of the videos of the releases that we have accomplished here at the Raptor Center. Um, so first up, we are gonna have the release of this beautiful swan. Now this trumpeter swan came to us with a cut along her neck, as well as leeches on her body and a really high lead poisoning level. So she had eaten some lead. Um, just like with humans, eating lead, not great. So we had to give her treatment two times a day. We had to inject her with medicine. Mm -hmm. We had to tube feed her, basically put a tube down her throat to feed her uh, to make sure she was getting all the right nutrients that she needed. And that took about two months of daily, twice a day treatment before she was ready to go. Uh, but as you can see, she was ready to leave and was swimming off. and. One of my coworkers actually saw her a couple days later with the rest of her family. So that was, that was a lot of work and it turned out pretty excellent. Uh, next up is one of our quick turnover patients. This little hummingbird had run into a window and was just kind of stunned. We were super glad to see this hummingbird leave so quickly because young hummingbirds, they need to be fed about every 15 minutes. And that is from sunup to sundown. Now this one was an adult, so it could self-feed, but we still wanted to get it back out in the wild as quickly as possible. Uh, and sometimes the birds are more ready than we are. As you can see in this little video, uh, my reflexes aren't always great, but that little storm petrel was ready to leave. And that's mostly because the only reason it came in is because of a storm. Now storm petrels, the birds, they are very well suited for swimming, not so much for walking. So when it's rainy out, they'll land on pavements on like a wet parking lot because they think it's the ocean. And then they can't actually take off again. They're stuck there. So they're really easy to release. We just grab them. We keep them inside until nightfall because they are nocturnal birds. And then come dusk, we just take them to the ocean and toss them in just like little potatoes. Uh, they're, pretty fun to, they're pretty fun to see flying away. And this last video here, you can see just how crucial it is that we're getting these birds back out into the wild. Uh, some people might wonder, why are we releasing this owl in the snow? You know, surely we could wait until springtime when the weather is nicer. But with this great horned owl, we actually wanna make sure that he got released early enough that if he wants to put any territory up or find a mate, that's the time of year that he would be doing that. So since he was healthy, he was in great shape, um, he had gotten tangled in a soccer net and was starving. 
So we were able to fix both those problems really easily. And then we were able to get him back out into the wild as quickly as possible. Because again, not only is that good for him, but it is also our goal here at the Raptor Center. Uh, we wanna make sure we're getting wild birds back out to the wild as quickly as we can. Well, that is about all I have for today. Uh, thank you all for joining me and I will swing it back over. Thank you so much, Hannah. We loved having you as a partner today. And thank you for teaching us about these magnificent animals. We appreciate the work that you guys do up there. And uh, we love seeing those uh, start to finish stories from uh, all kinds of different animals. So we appreciate having you on today and you showing us that. So I bring this live stream to a close. I wanna thank you for tuning in today. And we will see you next Tuesday as we will be partnering with Dr. Gordon Court with the Alberta Environment and Parks at 1 p.m. Central Time. Don't forget to tune in. And again, we rem remember we all live downstream. We'll see you then.